My name is Barbara Heitkamp. I am a water resources education specialist with the East Metro Water Resource Education Program. Um, and we're excited to bring this program to you tonight that's talking about a very unique and treasured landscape. Um, and that is the uh, wonderful uh, wetlands um, that we have pervasive um, throughout our Minnesota uh, area. Um, I have a couple esteemed colleagues who are going to uh, be here to uh, share their knowledge in working in these landscapes. And uh, hopefully it's just a, it's a good time. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the East Metro Water Resource uh, Education Program. Uh, this is a program that's been in place uh, that was formed in 2006, and it actually represents um, a partnership of 25 local government units. Um, it is a program that is hosted um, at the Washington Conservation District. Um, and uh, uh, it's really focused on um, being able to build education programs uh, for community members, businesses, staff, uh, um, and uh, decision makers, uh, really looking at issues that affect uh, lakes, rivers, streams, uh, wetlands, groundwater. And it's really encouraging people to, to take action, um, to engage themselves in uh, projects that will help uh, restore and protect um, our natural resources. Um, and so we've been primarily based in Washington County for the last 15 years. We're actually starting to edge our program a bit north this coming year to Chisago and Isanti and Pine counties, uh, which is really exciting. But we have a lot of events that we're starting to plan for 2022. And so um, if you follow the Washington Conservation District's Facebook page, um, we're also on the Twitters and the Instagram. Um, we have a very active blog. Um, we invite you to uh, take advantage of some of our other offerings. Um, but as mentioned tonight, we're going to be focusing on this really um, fantastic landscape. And so if you uh, live adjoining to or near a wetland, um, you probably already know um, what a wonderful resource that they can be in terms of um, hosting very diverse habitat for a lot of different organisms, um, have this diverse and rich um, flora associated with it as well. And so what we're hoping to do tonight is really just kind of talk through what are these wetlands, what are the different classifications of them, um, what lakes uh, wetlands special, um, how to improve uh, the habitat, the wetland, the wetland habitat that you might have, and how you can go about creating that beautiful yard that really is not just about it being beautiful to you, but also being attractive and functional and useful um, for all the organisms uh, that, that are using it and that it operates in our environment in such a way that helps improve water quality. So this is where I'm actually going to turn things over um, to my uh, associate colleague, Jay Riggs, who is actually the district manager of the Washington Conservation District and self-dubbed wetland guy. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so he can share his. Excellent. Well, thank you. I want to start just doing a quick introduction of myself. And as a self-proclaimed wetland geek, I am very excited to be here this evening. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. Um, I, As Barbara mentioned, I'm the district manager uh, for the Washington Conservation District, but that's about half my job. The other half of my job is doing kind of other natural resource uh, activities. A big piece of that is working on wetland related issues. And so I am the, the county representative uh, for the Wetland Conservation Act and implementing that, that state law at the local level in Washington County. Uh, my background is, is a mix of uh, biology and water resources. My first job out of grad school was actually working for a uh, consulting firm doing wetland delineations and permitting work. Uh, so I, I got to do a lot of work in Washington County in the mid 90s delineated a lot of wetlands, did a lot of field work out there, delineated the wetland at the Menards and Oakdale, and uh, did a lot of delineations in Woodbury and, and all, all over the county. So I, I got to see a lot of those things early on in, in some, of the, some of those communities as they were developing. And now I am I'm serving as the, the wetland uh, specialist uh, for, for the county and get to do field work, uh, meet with landowners to, to, if they have questions about wetland permits, and serve on what's called the technical evaluation panel for the state law, and uh, also get to work on a lot of different sides of that state law, both on the 
proactive, helping people make sure they're not breaking the law. And then unfortunately, also on the other side of things, if there are, are uh, compliance issues that I'm very involved in the enforcement side of things. And so that's that's kind of my role. Uh, today, actually, I got to work on a wide variety of wetland related topics. I, I got to respond to some wetland permit applications. I got an email from a uh, landowner in uh, Hugo about some wetlands. Uh, we got to do a site review of about six different uh, sites uh, in May Township and the city of Scandia. And then also got an email from a resident of um, a city in Massachusetts, because apparently if you do any sort of search about wetlands uh, and the term Washington, um, then our website comes up. And so I get, I get, I get questions from all over the country, honestly. I've, there are amazingly a lot of Washington counties in this country. Uh, so with that, I'll just get started. I'm going to start sharing my presentation here. Uh, before I get going, though, what I'd like to do is get um, some information from the crowd, try to make this as interactive as possible. But if you could in the chat button, let me know what community you live in and um, whether, like how many acres do you own? So like if you're in May Township, put in May and 20 or something like that. I'd like to kind of see where people are at and what we have. And Barb, if you don't mind giving me kind of a summary because now I've shared my presentation and now I can't see a lot of that stuff. There we go. Okay, there we go. Matt, Lake Elmo three. Jody, West Lakeland, four. We don't have a lot of wetlands in West Lakeland. Okay, we have, we have someone from Anoka County. Nice. Cool. Okay, a lot of people outside of Washington County. I'll wait for you one or two more. I'm very curious. Marina and St. Croix, five acres. Nice. That's like one quarter of Marina and St. Croix. We have somebody from Ohio. Very exciting. Cool. So what I'm going to talk about is, thank you. That's great. So what I'm going to talk about then is kind of a basic wetlands 101 and talk a little bit about how wetlands are classified, the different types of wetlands, and then just give a basic, basic introduction to wetland rules. And I'm really talking specifically about Minnesota wetland rules. Um, I will talk a little bit about the federal laws that apply to wetlands. I don't get the Ohio person. I don't know actually um, whether or not you have uh, regulations, um, what the regulations are at the local level, but um, uh, I'm, if you have any other specific questions, I'm sure I can point you in the right direction. So starting out, what is a wetland? This is where I'm going to get into the technical jargon. And if I use acronyms and I don't define them, then Barbara, you're going to need to speak up and let me know because you are this big on my screen. And you have to be about this big for me to actually be able to focus on you. So you're going to no have to- No worries. Really I, will be, I will be pestering and interrupting if I need to be. Excellent. So- what is a wetland? And we define wetlands very, very carefully in the state of Minnesota and in the U.S. because wetlands are regulated. Wetlands are regulated under federal law, state law, and local law. So we, it's very important for us to understand what is a wetland from the regulatory side and from the management side of things, because there are some things you can do in wetlands that are not regulated, and there are the things that you can't do in wetlands, or you have to get a permit to do it. Um, these areas are very strictly regulated for a number of reasons that Andy is going to get into more because wetlands are pretty awesome. Uh, so what is a wetland? A uh, wetland is an area that has a combination of hydric soils, hydrophytic vegetation, and hydrology. And hydric soils mean a uh, type of soils that have changed how they look physically because of the presence of water for a long duration. Um, and hydrophytic vegetation is a fancy way of saying wetland plants. And there are actually books and lists of plants that, can, that you can see whether or not they are uh, found in wetlands all the time or if they're uh, only in wetlands part of the time. And so when wetland scientists are out looking at plants and, and determining if an area is wetland, they'll look at a plant, they'll look up the list, and they'll determine whether or not it is a 
always 100% wetland plant or 50-50 wetland plant. And in Minnesota, we have, in most of the, the Midwest, we have this plant called reed canary grass, which is a grass that is very, very common, uh, very, very adaptable, it is mostly a wetland plant, but in some parts of the, of the county and some parts of the state, it can grow way up to the side of hills. And so it's one of those things where it's like, you look at that, you're like, probably wetland, but you then have to look at these other indications like hydric soils. And then the last indicator for determining an area, whether or not it's wetland is saturation and inundation. And that means it's wet um, at, to the surface or ponding water or within 12 inches of the surface during, and this is all or part of the growing season, but this is where it gets a little tricky. For an area to be technically wetland, it only has to be wet two weeks out of the growing season. So once the soil temperatures are above 50 degrees, that's the definition of the beginning of the, of the growing season. And if you, have, if you have saturation to the surface or close to the surface within those two weeks after the growing season starts, then that area could technically be wetland. So an area doesn't have to have standing water or cattail, doesn't have to have uh, standing water most of the year uh, to be technically a wetland or regulated as a wetland. It has to have all these three um, conditions, but it, it doesn't have to be super wet all the time. And this year, in Minnesota, we're experiencing a drought, which is really fascinating because we had seven years of wet weather. And in lots of this county, we had the, we had the highest water levels ever in, in our wetland systems. And then this year, we've had a pre, you know end of last year and into this year, we have a very significant drought. So a lot of those areas um, that were standing water are now mud flats or dry. And so it makes it really challenging from um, the wetland management perspective, if you're trying to determine areas wetland or not, unless you're able to look at these, these uh, three criteria. So today, when I was out on these site visits, areas were very dry, but we're able to look at the soils, look at the vegetation, and then look at the, a lot of this is kind of forensic biology, um, evidence of saturation or inundation uh, determine if areas are regulated or not. And we actually are out there putting line, you know, working with consultants to put lines on the ground for the areas that are jurisdictional. So, you know what? I'm going to throw it out there. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? Can you throw it in the chat? And if I need to slow down, I'm feeling a little bit hyper right now because I went, I went from interviewing uh, candidates for a for a cool job right away in the morning to doing field reviews to then getting home and then shoveling manure. So I'm like, just <laughs> nonstop today. So I had an hour of prepping for uh, the snow we're going to be getting soon. Any questions, Barbara? There's none here. I okay, would say free to continue. Then. Thank you. So let's look at these three criteria a little bit more closely because um, it's, there is a lot of science behind what is technically a wetland. And if you, if you look at the soils, for example, uh, you have uh, mineral soils and organic soils. And organic soils develop in areas where the plants do not decompose, decompose because the waters uh, up to the surface are higher uh, for most of the year. And organic soils can range from thickness of two to 30 feet. And um, the plants, if you look at an organic soil, the plants are still visi visible in many of these soils, including peats. Um, the other cool thing about organic soils is that this is, makes it really fun if you're a, a um, wetland delineator. You can like go into like a wetland area, you just bounce a little bit, and if it's pretty bouncy, you're pretty much guaranteed it's an organic soil or high organic content, or at least very wet. Um, uh, so today when I was out in the field, we're actually able to walk in a lot of these organic soils because uh, the water levels are so low. But if you find that type of organic soil, that means you're in a wetland, uh, unless it's been effectively drained. And that's the other piece of it is that there are some areas where there's been ditching or tiling, where they were historically wetland, they have organic soils, but the hydrology isn't there. So that adds a level of complexity for determining if an area is jurisdictional, because if it's effectively drained, it's non-wetland doesn't really apply a lot in Washington County because we don't have a lot of ditching or tiling. Uh, but in Anoka County, for example, there's a lot of ditches through some of those sandy soil areas. And there are a lot of areas like Blaine and Brooklyn Center and those areas where there's some uh, ditch wetland systems that have organic soils that are not jurisdictional. Um, 
and uh, still look and feel and smell like wetland, but they're not. So then mineral soils, this is where it gets really interesting. If you can geek out about hydric soils, um, I encourage you to look into this because uh, hydric soils are just fascinating, can be actually very beautiful because of the colorations that you see. So you, you dig a hole, you dig a soil pit, you look at the soils, you pull them up. And if you start seeing really dark, um, really dark colored soils at the surface, which is usually because there's a lot of organic in it. And then if you start seeing grayer soils and these things called, um, you can see what are called concretions or uh, the technical term is redox amorphic features. I and mean, that's like red stuff in the soil. And you can see in this, this image here, those red things there, that's where iron is um, when the water comes up in those soils and the iron it dissolves in the soil and then it reconnects to, to areas in the soil further down typically when the water levels change. Um, and then you start seeing these concretions or you know splotches of red in the soil. And that's usually a very good indicator uh, that it's a hydric soil. And the color of the soil changes to more gray because in Minnesota, we have, we have higher iron content. And okay, whose finger do I keep seeing on the screen there? We're gonna ask, that's a little, there we go. Hey, Deborah, do you mind turning your video off, please? Thank you. Awesome. Um, and so they'll turn gray and they'll turn, they'll turn bluish colors. Uh, and then the other piece that you'll notice with hydric soils is that if they're wet a lot of the time or most of the time, then they'll, they'll smell like rotten eggs, which is kind of cool. So to, to look at the soils, you'll be digging holes. This is, an, this is an, uh, uh, definitely a hydric soil wetland area because you see arrowhead, uh, which is an, an obligate 100% wetland plant. Uh, and then this funny, funny thing here that they're showing in the bottom left-hand side of that screen there with the little dots in it, that's actually a Munsell soil chart. So they're looking at the colors of the soil. So it's like paint chips. If you want to, you know, go to the store and, and grab different paint colors, this is, there's this thing called Munsell and it has all these different soil colors that you can then hold the little soil splotch behind those holes and then look at the different colors and uh, be able to so say specifically if it's a 10YR33 soil, for example, and, and, and then you look at the delineation guides and they'll tell you if that's, if that type of color is a uh, highly likely a wetland soil or an indicator of wetland soil. Now, moving into hydrology, Barbara, how, how am I doing for time? I feel like I'm saying a lot, taking you a lot of time. You have approximately 15, 20 minutes. So oh, good, perfect. Good. So sources of hydrology for these wetland systems come for a number, number of of sources, but it's primarily you're going to have uh, surface water flow, you're going to have groundwater flow, and then for the groundwater flow, you can either have, you know, deep, deep groundwater flow or, sh or shallow aquifers. And so uh, for, it's really interesting this time of year, um, try to, trying to like look at the landscape and trying to predict what's happen, going to happen to our wetlands next spring after the winter. And so this is one of those things, if you have uh, for example, a surface water fed system, and we have a dry fall, and then we have a, we have a, you know, it freezes and we have snow on dry soils that are frozen, then in the spring when it thaws out, that snow just disappears really quickly. And so those surface water dependent wetlands aren't going to be very wet next spring if we have a dry fall and then snow. Uh, but conversely, if we have a wet fall and then it freezes hard and then decent snow, then a lot of those surface water dependent wetlands are going to be very wet and will have high water levels in those areas. And so by kind of watching those patterns, you can get an idea of what the source of the hydrology is for your wet, wetland systems. Uh, in northeastern Washington County, for example, we have a lot of groundwater fed systems. So then after the seven, seven year wet period that ended, um, uh, in the end of 2019, um, then those, those groundwater fed systems now are really, really starting to dry out. Although there are parts of Washington County that still have relatively high water levels. Uh, Lake Elmo, for example, and uh, the east side of Oakdale, there's still some pretty high water levels in a lot of those systems. 
uh, and that's just because there's just a lot of a lot of water and large drainage area and there's not apparently there's not a lot of not a lot of flow out of those systems uh, but that's how wetlands work and so that's one of the benefits or one of the great things about wetlands though is that they are a great place for water storage they mitigate flooding and uh, they're a great pla place for groundwater recharge to occur I don't want to steal any of Andy's thunder if he's going to be getting into that more. So then if you have property and you look up a wetland map, one of the things you're going to see a lot of are these classifications for wetlands. And that they're the, there are two different main classification systems that are used for wetlands. There's Circular 39, and there's also the Corden classification system. Um, they're kind of funky names, but Circular 39 is, is it, the federal uh, government put out documents and they called them circular whatever. So there's circular 39, circular whatever. And so there's that's why it got that name. And then they classified wetlands based on type. And there's also the Gordon classification system that was put out later uh, named after the person who invented it. So anyway, uh, circular 39 classification, you have eight different types, type one to type eight. It's not drier to wetter, unfortunately. Uh, type one through five, is drier to wetter. So type one is only occasionally wet. Type five is shallow open water. Um, and then the distinction between what is a wetland and what is a lake, this is an interesting one. In the state of Minnesota, they recently changed the classification, the, the depth, but if it's deeper than eight and a half feet, uh, it's not a wetland. That's, that's the cutoff between what's wetland and what's lake, non-wetland. And that used to be six and a half feet until a couple of years ago, but there were some studies that were done that looked at what's, what depth can vegetation grow to. And the science is showing that actually a lot of these, these uh, plants can actually grow um, in deeper than what we originally thought. So that, that uh, what is the max depth of a wetland change relative in the last two years. So they have a different, you know, they're called type one, two, three, four, five, six, and then type Type six is a shrub swamp, uh, meaning you have like an alder swamp or something like that. Type seven is a wooded swamp. So we have a lot of those in Washington County, especially along the St. Croix, we have black ash swamps. And then a type eight is a bog. Uh, those areas have um, super organic soil. We have a, quite a few actually floating bogs in Washington County, um, quite a few in, in uh, May Township in particular around the Kel Kelly Farms in that area. And they typically have an acidic chemistry. Uh, so in addition, to, so here's actually an example of a oh, typical wetland. Um, this is a circular 39 type five deep marsh. Uh, I put a little asterisk here to note that if you're in a community and you're looking at potentially wetland permitting, wetland type is not the same as management classification in your local zoning code for setbacks. It's not the same thing. So don't presume that if you have a type three wetland, that means it's management classification three. It's not the same thing at all. Management classification in the local zoning codes typically is referred to the quality of the wetland, how many invasive species are in it, uh, how unique it is. And so you'll have higher setbacks for, for building permits, for example, for a management classification one. Um, but that has nothing to do with the type. Uh, then also, then back here, going back to the slide here, looking at the, the other classification system, the Corden classification, which is what's used. And if you look at the county website for wetland mapping, they, they have the National Wetland Inventory, which is a um, um, map based on aerial photography interpretation. So it is a good map to identify if you have an obvious wetland, but it is not the end all for determining if you have a wetland. The only way to determine if you actually have a wetland is to have someone look at it in the field because there are a lot of wetlands that are not in the National Wetland Inventory uh, that are still regulated. And then the, the cordon classification for this one, for example, this is a PMF, this is a Palestrian emergent uh, semi-permanently flooded wetland. Uh, then you have uh, further out is the vegetated area, which is a Palestrian emergent. Um, Gosh, the sea is the um, seasonally flooded basin. This is a PSSC, which is a shrub swamp, and a PEMB is a 
intermittently flooded, that would be like a type two. So type five, type three, type seven, type two is how those classifications kind of line up. Uh, here's some great photos. This is not just a soccer field. This is a seasonally flooded basin. And if you come out here late summer or this fall, for example, uh, it this might be really hard to tell whether or not it's a wetland because people like to mow these areas, obviously, and it it may not look wet at all. And it only has to, it has to be wet like five out of ten years. Uh, but if we're in a real drought, it's sometimes hard to tell, and that's that people kind of you can get caught in that if you you know look at this, presume it's not wet, and then try to build something here, and then it gets flooded. But anyway, this is a classic example of type one. You'd look at this, you'd look at aero photos to see whether or not there's ponding or inundation there. And then you would um, look at the soils um, and then look at evidence of hydrology. In this case, most of the year, it's not gonna have um, a lot of water in it. So you're looking at secondary indicators uh, like uh, landscape position or um, maybe some of the vegetation's not doing well. And that's what's happening here. You have your, your Kentucky bluegrass isn't doing well because this floods out. And you can see that this is, you also look at the contour and the elevation and how all those other things. Uh, but in this case, it's gonna be mostly looking at uh, soils and, and uh, landscape position and probably some evidence of vegetation there to tell you that it's a jurisdictional wetland. Uh, here's a type one wooded wetland, uh, also known as a vernal pool. These are beautiful systems are really important because they provide some very critical amphibian habitat uh, in the early spring, but these areas oftentimes uh, by summer or fall are totally dry and it's hard to tell uh, that it's a jurisdictional wetland, but you actually, this one is delineated. You can see these flags that are put out there. Uh, these are delineation flags. This person nailed this boundary um, for the most part, except it looks like they didn't catch this piece here, um, probably just because it's subtle topography. But these systems are found all over Washington County and are very important hydrologically, uh, oftentimes tricky to identify. Um, this, some of my favorite wetlands that I've seen are actually some of these, these uh, wooded wetlands. Uh, this is a sedge meadow. We'll have standing water in the spring usually. Uh, the rest of the year, it's just going to be saturated soils or potentially drier and has a lot of different vegetation, uh, typically dominated by uh, sedges, but we'll also have like swamp milkweed and blue vervain and a lot of other cool things like that. Uh, they skip type three. <laughs> um, uh oh, here we go. Type three looks a lot like a type four, um, but a type four will have more open water. So that's where you'll see your cattail systems. Um, like more, most people think of a wetland as a type three or type four. Type six is a shrub swamp. This is a cool one. This uh, has a bunch of alder growing in it. So it's dominated mostly by the shrubs, but it's gonna have pretty high, high organic soil and then uh, pretty high groundwater table usually. Uh, this is a type eight bog. Um, we have some really cool, really cool bogs to look at in Washington County. One of the, the one that's you can go look at is uh, the uh, former Warner Nature Center that will hopefully open up again someday. Uh, you can go look at that awesome bog system that's out there. Uh, so resources and tools. Uh, there's a lot of great websites for you to look at. Um, Barb, are you going to be able to post this somewhere so people can I will send it out in an email at the end of the, the workshop. You're awesome. Thank you. Uh, so there's a lot of good information out there. Uh, the you know, um, U.S. Department of Ag has a web soil survey, so you can see what your soils are on your site. Uh, but that, once again, all these, these mapping things are just tools to identify if you probably have a wetland, but the only way to determine if you for sure do have a wetland is to have a wetland delineation or a delineator come out to your site. And if you really want to geek out, look up the 1987 Corps of Engineers delineation manual. So I'm almost done. Rules of wetlands. So the, the Section 404 of the Federal Clean Water Act, in addition to the Minnesota Wetland Conservation Act, regulate draining, filling, and altering of wetlands. So draining, filling, and some excavation. So 
If you want to drain, fill, or excavate any of these wetland areas, you need to contact your local unit of government or contact your county SWCD person to find out if your activity is regulated and then what the permit implications are. In Washington County, we have eight different watershed organizations that, that some of them have their, their own wetland uh, permitting requirements. The uh, Cornelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District, for example, has much stricter rules than other watersheds in the area. So if you're in Scandia, May Township, Stillwater Township, et cetera, then you're, uh, you're going to have some potentially stricter requirements for doing anything in and around your wetlands. Um, so like I said before, not all wetlands hold water throughout the year. So uh, please check, check in with me or your LGU or uh, your watershed person to make sure that what you're thinking about doing with your wetland is not regulated. Uh, in addition to that, there are also cities and watersheds that require and then buffers, unmowed buffers around wetlands. So when you buy a new property, uh, take, make sure that you know whether or not there's existing buffers or easements around them. Uh, for new projects, if you're putting in a driveway or a shed or additions or anything like that requiring building permits, uh, you may also have some uh, city or watershed uh, setbacks. May Townships, uh, City of Scandia, both have uh, setbacks uh, from wetlands. That is a local zoning requirement that is in addition to the state and federal law requirements. Um, let's see. So draining means you, you cut a ditch or put in a tile to turn the wetland to non-wetland. Fill, fill is pretty obvious, but keep in mind that filling doesn't just mean dirt or gravel. Uh, putting um, wood chips in a wetland is technically filling. And then this altering things, excavation, I get a lot of calls about people wanting to excavate their wetland to make it have more open water. Uh, the type one and two wetlands are uh, not regulated under the Wetland Conservation Act for excavation, uh, but they might be regulated by other uh, local codes. So check, check with me or, or your other LGU person, local government unit. Uh, excavation of wetter wetlands is regulated. And there are ways to do wetland excavation that are good for wildlife habitat, for example. And so you may be able to get permits to do that, but it's something that you really need to work with your local SWC, uh, for example, to be able to do that properly and to make sure that you don't get in trouble because you don't want the DNR conservation officer uh, coming out there and giving you an, a resource protection notice or a restoration or anything like that because that can get quite costly. And you have a lot of resources available to you to find out if what you're thinking about doing uh, is uh, regulated or not. So Aaron Hall asked the question, is it illegal to hike in a wetland or trim tall grass to allow easier hiking through it? Um, unless it depends, if you're within a shoreland area, there are shoreland vegetation requirements in Minnesota. So if you're within X number of feet of a protected uh, lake, a DNR protected water, for example, vegetation removal might be managed. Um, but under the Wetland Conservation Act, um, mowing or vegetation removal is not regulated. We went to a site today where someone had 16 pallets to set on the side of the wetland uh, for temporary access around the edge of their wetland. That is removable, probably okay under the Wetland Conservation Act. If they had put wood chips or dirt to do that same trail, that would be regulated in a violation of the law, probably. Are there any other questions that people want to voice or put in the chat? All right, Jay, I would say continue on. Oh, we've got one. I think one. I'm done. I think I already covered all these things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have one I'm more question. I'm out of time, aren't I? You're, you did perfectly. Um, <laughs> are retention ponds ever considered to be wetlands? It depends. Most of these questions, their response is it depends. So if your retention pond is was created like in the 90s, for example, some of them were excavated within wetlands. That area is regulated as a wetland. If it was a retention pond excavated out of an upland area, a non-wetland area, then it is not regulated. It is considered incidental. 
And most retention ponds are owned by somebody else, either the homeowners association or the city typically. And so in addition to the, the whatever water resource laws that might apply, you're, they're also regulated by that local unit of government that is responsible for that outlot or stormwater facility. Um, another question, do parks, i.e. public land also follow these rules? Great question, Kathy, yes. And I have a question that I wrote down too. So you mentioned um, if folks are interested in uh, delineating their wetlands to contact a wetland delineator. How do you contact a wetland delineator? Who that's, would that be? That, that's a great question. So wetland delineators, if you're if you're doing, so you're like, I can't delineate your wetland in, in, uh, in Washington County because I'm the one who's responsible for helping review whether or not the delineation is done properly because there's a whole process. Once a delineation is done, it goes through a review. Uh, so what you're gonna need to do is hire a consultant. And you can email me if you're in Washington County and I can give you a list of consultants. If you're in the state of Minnesota, the Board of Water and Soil Resources has a list of certified wetland delineators. And that would be a good place to start. Most consulting firms, like engineering firms or, or environmental firms, will have wetland delineators on staff, but a lot of the delineators are, you know, one person shops or very small companies. All right. Well, yes, you're perfectly on time. Good job. Um, and so we're actually going to shift gears a little bit and let's talk a little bit more about the plants. Let's talk a little bit more about the habitat. And so we're gonna be turning it over to uh, Andrew Novak, who is a uh, natural resource specialist um, with the Washington Conservation District. Um, and so uh, Andy, I'll leave it up to you to introduce yourself a little bit and uh, you can take us away. Thanks so much, Barbara. And uh, great job, Jay, that was, Really awesome to see you present that information. Um, I am a landscape restoration specialist for Washington Conservation District. Um, I am a trained landscape architect with a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Minnesota College of Design. Um, I've been working as a designer and or landscape implementation um, professional for um, Boy, almost 30 years now. Um, I owned my own company at one time that did primary landscape installations and lawn care, um, including shoreline work and uh, wetland management. Um, I worked for a professional, uh, I worked as a professional gardener for a number of years uh, for the city of St. Cloud at their epic Clemens and Munsinger Gardens. Um, before going to graduate school and then getting my master's degree in landscape architecture. Um, and uh, while in <clears throat> school, uh, I became very interested in um, the role of plants in our environment um, for not only um, looking very pretty and being very nice in gardens, but also the myriad of ecological benefits that plants provide. Um, so uh, including um, amongst other things, wetlands and uh, stormwater management. So most of my work at uh, Washington Conservation District um, involves designing um, planting plans for folks that are interested in um, mitigating uh, the effects of stormwater runoff, for example, or providing pollinator habitat um, for butterflies, bees, birds, and the like. Um, and uh, shoreline uh, restoration projects are very popular. And uh, also, of course, um, taking a look at uh, their wetlands and helping them um, figure out a plan to um, improve diversity of species um, and increase the ecological functioning of their wetland. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And uh, in this section, we're going to talk about what makes wetlands wonderful places. Um, 
Jay did indeed touch on some of this stuff a little bit, but um, and none of what I have to say really is going to repeat too much. Um, we're going to talk about how wetlands um, prevent floods and uh, can be a very important piece of our landscape that protects um, the integrity of our landscape from erosion. Um, with you know the prevention of floods um, comes water quality improvements. Um, wetlands are very important for um, water quality in any um, hydro, hydrological system. Um, and part of what makes wetlands function um, is the diverse plant um, species, otherwise known as flora. Um, and also what makes wonderful uh, wetlands are, is the diversity of animal species, otherwise known as fauna. So wetlands along the edges of streams, rivers, and lakes, they provide very critical protection from flooding and erosion. In effect, wetlands function as a kind of a natural sponge. They can collect very heavy rainfalls and they also collect snow, snow melt and they release it very slowly um, as surface water in manageable quantities in a manageable amount of time. Um, wetlands also are important places for um, infiltration of water that basically recharge groundwater levels. And Jay talked about that a little bit, both shallow aquifers and deep water aquifers. Um, and wetlands are a key facet to how those systems work. Um, the combined effect of this water storage and this slowing of water or this breaking action lowers overall flood elevations throughout an entire region and um, thereby also reduces the amount of erosion. And often it's erosion and flooding that are the main reasons we have um, polluted water bodies because of surface um, runoff carrying sediment and pollution to these bodies of water directly. Uh, and wetlands kind of hold those waters, sponge them, allow the sediment to um, drop out slowly um, and also allow plant material to evapotranspirate a lot of water. Etc. Wetlands also protect water quality as acting kind of like uh, kidneys would do, or like a landscape kidney. Um, plants will um, evapotranspirate water by taking it up into its root structure. Um, and also, um, these soils that we talk about in wetland systems also slowly filter nutrients that would otherwise, again, flow quickly downstream to rivers and lakes. Um, these excess nutrients from fast moving surface water, pollute water bodies and um, excess nutrients can lead to huge algae blooms. Um, and we know that those large algae blooms can kill aquatic life, including fish and insects. And this is a lovely project site near Lake Elmo. This one is Hardwood Creek by Hugo. Wetland uh, floral and fauna, approximately 43% of threatened and endangered species in the U.S. live in or depend on wetlands. Some of the species of concern prone to this type of, um, or I'm sorry, um, these wetlands provide critical habitat for many birds, mammals, insects, amphibians, and reptiles. Um, and for many of these species, wetlands are nurseries. Um, they're safe havens for um, them to raise their young. And with the degradation of these wetlands comes loss of habitat for these species. Some of these species prone to this habitat loss that we have in Washington County are um, things like the Blandings turtle, um, we have water hyssop, belted kingfishers, short beak arrowwood, the uh, water thrush, the Louisiana water thrush, and uh, the green-faced club-tailed dragonfly. Um, it's species richness that's the key to landscape resiliency. And when I say resiliency, I mean the ability of a landscape to adapt and thrive despite climatic changes like uh, excess rainfall or periods of drought. So like, you know, in Washington County, for example, we've had long periods of higher than water higher than normal water levels, but then we, um, you know, this year had a, a major drought 
Um, and those types of extremes, um, being able to weather those types of extremes are, is very important for protecting um, the integrity of the landscape. And uh, in wetlands with this diverse species richness, that's what is the, the key to this type of resiliency. And every species contributes to this species richness. And every, every species has a role to play for the ecological function of our wetland. Many times these relationships are very complex and they're not readily visible, but they're important just the same. A really good example of this is um, native bees and pollinators and native plants. Um, there are many types of bees that pollinate very specific types of flowers. And when you take either the bee or the flower out of the equation, we lose both those species and we lose some level of ecological function in that system because of that loss. Perhaps no creature is as much a keystone of wetlands as beavers. And yet most beavers throughout Washington County are trapped and killed. Um, perhaps this is mostly out of fear of damage to property um, but I talked to a lot of people where it's just basically a desire to keep the way that their landscape is highly developed and the certain aesthetic of their landscape, they want to keep that intact. Um, um, for many people, though, they just simply do not know the many benefits that beavers bring to wetland ecosystems. And these wetland benefits of having beavers are countless. By building dams, beavers engineer the landscape. Uh, they create the best quality habitat for fish, birds, insects, and pretty much everyone. Beaver dams create systems of terraced wetland pools. They can slow water down, allow plants to stabilize shorelines. Um, there are many places throughout the US and Europe where people are working with beaver to solve otherwise very expensive flooding problems. Um, simple devices can be put into place to control beaver wetland water elevation and to protect property. Um, a good question is, is there potential on your property to, to work in relationship with beavers? Are you interested in this topic? If you, if you are, please reach out. I'd love to discuss this more. Any questions so far? So. Wetlands are great. We're going to talk about how we can improve your wetland habitat. And we're going to talk a couple, about a couple of different things. We're going to talk about invasive species, and we're going to talk about um, restoring um, wetland systems with native plants. One of the most common uh, native or invasive species that we have in facing our wetlands these days is reed canary grass. In the area surrounding the cities, about 82% or more of our um, wetlands have been taken over by invasive species, and more often than not, what you'll find is reed canary grass. Um, reed canary grass is very aggressive. Uh, it's a cool season grass that quickly invades, and it will dominate many different types of wetland systems, um, as well as uh, even you know, uh, more drier upland systems surrounding wetlands. So it has a wide range of moisture tolerance. Um, it certainly thrives in disturbed environments. Uh, and a lot of times wetlands can be somewhat disturbed when we see fluctuations of, of water levels going up and down. Um, if there's not you know, a, a strong, very uh, intact wetland system of plants, um, plant life can die off and make room for reed canary grass to quickly invade. Um, it reproduces um, very uh, heavily by seeds. And here you can see um, the flower of the reed canary grass followed by the uh, seed heads. Um, it also reproduces um, by stem fragments and very dense system of underground rhizomes. Um, management of reed canary grass really is uh, contingent upon how much a person knows about the life cycle of this plant. Um, and we have lots of information for you about reed canary grass. So if, if you're looking at doing a project where you want to tackle some of this, um, please reach out. We can get you information about how to do that. Um, and even more importantly, we'll talk about later how to replace the reed canary grass once it's gone. Um, a really 
popular way to get rid of reed canary grass is to mow it down, spray it, um, let it die and turn brown, burn it, and then just repeat in that area for as long as it takes to knock it out. Usually, you know, a big hefty stand of reed canary grass, you can get rid of it um, in a season or you know, two at the most and uh, be ready to establish a native planting. Um, another very powerful invasive in our area is purple loosestrife. Um, purple loosestrife, like other flowering types of plants, um, can be managed um, best by making sure that you're knocking it out before it goes to seed. Um, here you see purple loosestrife in bloom. Uh, shortly after this, it will put up seed, and that seed will uh, spread um, prolifically. So if you're, you know, you can identify it while it's blooming, and then um, start your management then before it goes to seed. That's probably the best. Again, this is like uh, reed canary grass. It is a very um, prolific seed producer and will spread by seed quite readily. Um, but it also will spread from stem and root fragments, and it has an intense system of rhizomes, which are these fibrous roots that spread underground. Um, one of the important things to know about purple loosestrife is it really doesn't have a lot of um, competition in our area, so it can take over certain areas quite extensively. So again, um, in small areas, if you just have a few of them, um, you can pull, uh, pull them out by weeding them out. But in larger areas such as this, uh, you know, your, your, your best bet would probably be to hear, um, cut them back a little bit um, to open up the stems and leaves, uh, let them dry out a little bit, spray them, or I'm sorry, cut them, spray them, uh, let that kind of dry out a little bit. Uh, and then once it's, if, dry it out and you have some burnt some burnt crusty vegetation go ahead and um, burn them if you can um, if not then you can just uh, uh, mow that down and uh, repeat if necessary to knock it out no wetland presentation is complete without it talking about an arrow leaf cattail um, and broadleaf cattail. Um, in Minnesota, we have the native uh, cattail, broadleaf cattail. Um, and you can see the broadleaf cattail here is um, big, kind of wider, oops, sorry, and uh, looks almost like a corn dog. Whereas the invasive narrow leaf cattail has a distinctly different uh, flower um, and a lot skinnier and a different type of color. Um, so a good key to remember is that corn dogs are better than hot dogs. Oops, sorry, I keep switching the thing here. Um, the crazy thing about cattails, uh, narrow leaf cattail and broad leaf cattail um, can cross pollinate and produce the hybrid cattail or the super cat. Um, and so, Corn dogs, better than hot dogs, especially footlongs, is one good way to. Narrow leaf cattail, uh, the invasive species that we're targeting here, has this gap between re reproductive parts of the plant. And so that's a very good way to ID, uh, ID narrow leaf cattail compared to our native broadleaf, which does not have that gap. Um, the hybrid super cat, also has that uh, that gap so that's a good way to id those two different three different types of plants um, another way to id them is you can see here uh, the na native broadleaf cattail has a much broader stem than the narrow leaf stem so that's another way to id those um, cattails uh, Invasive cattails uh, are a real invasive species problem. Um, they form these giant monotypical uh, blankets of, of, of plant material that basically chokes out all diversity 
Um, if you see these large stands of narrow leaf cattail, chances are there's very little, if any, um, other plants growing in those um, areas. And in a sense, it's almost kind of like a, uh, a uh, desert, a vegetation desert, a wetland desert, a plant desert. It's just one type of plant covering everything. And it's an invasive species. So the ecological value um, that it provides in terms of pollinator habitat or animal habitat is, um, is very low. Um, and so um, learning how to ID narrow leaf cattail and how to um, mitigate the presence of narrow leaf cattail can be very important for your wetlands. Um, in small um, air, small sections, it can be manageable to um, deal with narrow leaf cattail and then restore native plants. Um, I, I've been working at it at our lake cabin for a number of years uh, and have had quite a bit of success. Um, the thing to know about um, you know dealing with any type of wetland plant like cattails or, or vegetation on in wetlands on, along shorelines is to um, do any of this work, you need to have a permit. And so uh, with, you know, my situation, for example, at our lake cabin, um, anything that any area over 2,500 square feet requires conversation with the Minnesota DNR uh, and they make the process really easily. Uh, easy to do um, and uh, usually I find it's pretty easy to create a project on and our lakeshore where we're dealing with 2,500 square feet at a time and I'll you know I'll go in I'll cut the the, the uh, cattails below the water level late in late in October uh, before the water freezes once it freezes uh, a lot of times I can freeze out the cattails um, whatever doesn't get frozen out will come up again next year and I will cut and I can uh, wipe them with a water safe glyphosate to system systemically kill the narrow leaf cattail. Um, and then Andy? once, yes, sir. Sorry, I just wanted to bring up one. That's a really good point you bring up about plant management and that um, mowing and, and removal of, of vegetation within a wetland is not regulated the same way as removal of veg vegetation within a DNR protected water. So if it is, and there's there's a map in, in Minnesota of what's DNR protected and what's um, technically a wetland. Um, and so that, that DNR protected waters map uh, that you can download off uh, from the uh, DNR website is important because those those water bodies are regulated very differently Right. Then right. wetlands under the Wetland Conservation Act. Right. So, and so like this would pertain to someone's private property, for example, like landowners that are here for the, the presentation. Like if you have um, your yard or your parcel bordering on a, on a lake shore or an open wetland, um, and you're going to remove over 2,500 square feet, my understanding is that you do have to talk to the DNR and have a plan yeah. in place. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and uh, and also, you know, mo most often our local watershed districts will also regulate, um, and they'll be in line with the, the Minnesota DNR. So the best thing to do when you're going to be doing a project like that is to contact us at the conservation district, and we can help you get um, everything sorted in that regard. Yep. Um, so yeah, good. Yeah, Thanks. I mean, there's some areas that have cattail that are cattail, and then. And usually the DNR jurisdiction is up to a certain elevation called the ordinary high water level. Yeah, yeah. And so you have areas that have an OHW of like an elevation of 940, but then you could have wetland that extends higher up than that that's regulated under different laws. Yeah, and so, I got the uh, ordinary high water level on that. Yeah. Coming up. In the, okay, got. Sorry. Yeah, I just no, wanted to make sure that folks understood that when I said wetland plant removal or mowing, for example, wasn't regulated. I'm specifically referring to the Wetland Conservation Act, but right. it is regulated in our DNR public waters. Uh, we have a question from Nicole about, do permits generally cost money? Um, yeah, the wetland, um, the wetland and lakeshore uh, permit with the DNR does cost money. It's like $25, $30, something like that. 
Um, and it depends on um, how much area you're taking out and how many people are involved in the project. So you know, if it's just a, like in our situation at our lake cabin, it costs us $35 um, to do it one year. Um, Great, but if you have to hire a wetland delineator and then go through a more complicated <laughs> permitting process, then it can cost thousands of dollars. In yeah, addition right. to, you know, the physical yeah. costs. So it, and, you know, part of the permit is, is, you know, if they're going to allow people to remove cattails or other invasive vegetation, you have to have a plan in place for restoring with native plants. So that's, yep. that's the back end of the permit is it, the permit requires that plan be in place. So for my position at the conservation district, for example, um, you know, I'll design these types of systems for people so that when they're applying for a grant or they need to do some work, they have a concept plan that outlines what they're going to be doing yep. um, in order to restore their lakeshore. And that will satisfy the permit requirements. And it's always cheaper to do the work up front. Yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah for sure. sure. It's worth yeah. it. It's worth it. We're going to do one other quick question. Um, it's uh, dealing back with uh, beavers. Um, I know of beavers in Ramsey County, but on public <laughs> land, are they dealt with as you are encouraging landowners to do? Are there examples in the Twin Cities of using devices to keep, keep to keep the beaver habitat but control water levels? Public lands, um, it, most of the time, beavers are being trapped. Um, in, in situ certain situations, they're being observed. Um, I know that, you know, for example, the Bellwin Conservancy um, is supportive of working with beavers. They have areas where they've had beaver dams in the past and they've observed. Um, other places, um, not so much. Um, I don't know of any, I don't know of any places in the area that are, um, actively like working with beavers to observe them and work with them proactively, uh, like I'm suggesting. Um, to me, it's kind of a newer um, uh, interest and something that I really think could be the key to solving a lot of issues we've had throughout like um, the watershed districts that I work in and throughout Washington County. Um, I know that there are a lot of studies um, in Europe and throughout us that i've looked at as case studies and those are um on youtube you can check those out i didn't get a chance to add some of the stuff into the presentation that i wanted to but if you're interested in it let me know because i do have some good videos that i can point to um there there are examples of you know interventions with for wildlife being implemented that are working um primarily for turtles. I don't see any reason why beavers couldn't be um, brought into certain areas throughout our county and uh, used to solve some flooding problems and some erosion issues. Hope that answers the question. Thanks, Andy. Um, we're at 7.08, so just FYI, we'll let you continue on. Cool. So once we've um, pretty much gotten rid of invasive species, um, we're looking at wanting to re restore these wetland areas with native plants. Native plants stabilize wetland shorelines, um, primarily against fluctuating water levels or what we call bounce. So if we have, you know, periods of high rain or high heavy snow melt, water levels can go up, but you know that water levels can also go down in drought. And these types of uh, plant systems build that kind of that resiliency that we're looking for and able to handle those fluctuating water levels. Again, the more diversity of species that we have, the more species richness, the more resilient these landscapes are going to be. So having a more diverse um, plant system is going to end up you know, weathering these climatic changes um, in a much more beneficial way. Um, Again, roots of native plants, they're like, they're like sponges um, and leaves can evaporate, evapotranspirate water. Um, native plants also can buffer wetlands from runoff from um, pollution caused by surface fuel. So in, for example, here we've got a roof and a driveway and all this water is gonna flow this way. 
And with simple design interventions, we can, um, you know, provide some curvature to our planting design that not only gives it more of a naturalized feel, but also can help to slow surface water that flows down toward the lake. In this example, we've got a slight curve to the path um, and that can create this, this way of, of um, buffering surface flow up on the upland or prairie type areas um, from reaching the uh, wetland areas or the shoreline area of the lakeshore. So uh, many times what I'll suggest for people when they're designing this type of a um, project is to think about um, you know, these different zones, these different planting zones associated with wetlands. Um, you know, very often we'll have a, you know, an upland area can be sort of a prairie or a savanna where the soils aren't going to be those hydric soils. They're going to probably, maybe they'll be a little more sandy or a little more loamy. And as we start to get closer to the wetland, we'll see wetter and wetter soils that change in their physical makeup. Um, like Jay was talking about earlier. And with those changes, then we're going to have, you know, different plant communities at each one of these zones. Um, so when designing these systems, I'm very, you know, I, I strongly suggest looking at this upland area, prairie area as being a very integral um, piece to the design, even though sometimes what people are really looking at doing is just simply a little bit of lakeshore. But, you know, if we build these with um, this diversity of plant zones, then we ultimately make this system a lot more resilient and able to weather big changes. Um, very frequently, um, it's very important to know in Washington County, for example, um, on the projects that I work on, uh, we need to know what this ordinary high water level is. And um, we can help you define what that, that, that level is because um, this is an important line for uh, permitting. Um, anything below this line often requires having some sort of a permit from either the watershed district or the DNR in order to um, do any work in this area, whereas the area above there, um, not so much. And typically, you know, the ordinary high water level can be a very good indicator, um, can be the plants that you find there, like, you know, like there will be more a, a different type of plant growing in this zone than say up in here because there is sometimes um, water inundating this area. These upland areas typically don't have any permanent water at all. Um, they can sometimes have temporary pooling of water, um, but usually that water would in, infiltrate into the ground within um, 24 hours. Whereas a wet meadow, can have anywhere from zero to three inches of standing water at all times. Um, emergent um, zone can have anywhere from three inches to 36 inches of water at any one time. And an aquatic um, zone, anywhere from six inches to six feet or more. And here you can see, you know, the distinct difference between these different plant zones. So they can give you the you know, kind of a key to what to look for. Uh, here's an example project where, you know, we put in this, this prairie type buffer in this area here to protect their wetland from surface runoff. So some of my um, favorite plants um, for restoring the upland prairie zone um, are wild blue indigo. Um, and what I'm really kind of interested in and when I'm, when I'm designing these types of projects is I'm, just, I'm interested in this idea of a plant community. You know, I want to have a mix of wildflowers that are going to bloom at various different times um, throughout the season to provide pollinator um, nectar sources for bees and butterflies. Um, another thing I'm really interested in is I'm interested in um, how various plants have different root structures. And wild blue indigo is a really great example of a plant that has um, a super great um, root structure. It's, it's known as a legume. And so 
um, incorporating legumes like wild blue indigo into these plantings is a real key to building soil health and uh, providing good habitat for all of the other surrounding plants in the plant community. Um, so that's a, you know, a legume species like wild blue indigo is something that I always suggest. Another great plant can be is, that I like is St. John's wort. It, it blooms for a very long time. It blooms at a critical time in pollinators life cycle that not of all, a lot of other plants are blooming. Um, and it also has a really intense, deep um, root structure uh, that is very resilient to a wide range of different moisture um, uh, conditions. So using a plant like St. John's wort on your prairie project um, in the upland area, in, in, in certain situations you might have water, the water level might get um, you know, higher than normal and it might creep into your prairie upland area a little bit. Most of these plants then have the ability to deal with this temporary moisture um, and, and will protect your shoreline um, where turf grass isn't going to do that for you. Um, another great um, plant I like to choose, uh, rose milkweed. Um, there are many different types of native milkweeds throughout Washington County. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, it is a host for a variety of butterflies, including monarchs, um, but it also attracts a wide variety of native bees um, and grows again with a, um, you know, various um, different moisture tolerances that it can deal with um, throughout a grow any given growing season. So it can be good for droughty areas, but it can also be used in rain gardens or for wetland planting seeds. The key to these upland um, plant communities are a lot of times grasses, like uh, little blue stem grass, oops, uh, prairie drop seed, oops, that's supposed to say uh, side oats grama. <laughs> that's actually side oats grama. Again, what we're looking for is we're looking for a plant community. We're looking for a mix of grasses and wildflowers that have uh, um, a range of moisture tolerance. And these grasses um, can be very dry, but they will also um, tolerate um, medium to medium wet moisture for a short periods of time in case of fluctuations in the water level. When we're looking at the uh, zero to three inches of normal water level, um, we're looking at more of a, a wet meadow type of uh, plant zone. Um, some good species for the wet meadow plant zone, uh, Joe pie weed, turtle head, blue flag iris. Um, these are all really great species of native flowers that look really super great in your landscape, but they also have um, a myriad of ecological functions, um, the root structures and the, the nectar source for pollinators all three very good, very popular, and very readily available. Um, the key to these, um, this plant zone more often is sedges. Um, one of the things that I really like about sedges and one of the keys to it that makes sedges so important is they're cool season growers, meaning that they begin growth very early in the year when soil temperatures and air temperatures are cooler. Whereas most of the grass species that we have that are native are, are more warmer season or growers. And so having this, uh, this immediate spring greeting, so to speak, um, is very important in a wetland system because uh, we need to have uh, ground cover that is very strong and very resilient against erosion. So um, sedges are a key component of the plant community for this wet meadow zone. Um, when I design these systems for people, what we'll do is we'll um, design a system where we lay out a, a, a grid, so to speak, of sedges and grasses planted 18 inches on center. And then the space between the grasses and sedges will grow, will put the flowering plant species that we're talking about um, so that they grow up together in a plant community. Here's a couple of uh, 
local sedges that are very common, lake sedge on the left, um, wire sedge, and then you got cotton grass mixed in with the wire sedge. There's 81 varieties of sedge native to Minnesota. Um, so if you're interested in designing this type of system, um, we can get you resources to uh, find the right sedges and grasses to mix with the flowers. Um, and we can help you out if you're in Washington County. Um, some other wet meadow grasses and rushes that are also very important along with sedges. Um, typically in these systems, the grasses and rushes will form uh, a very deep network of, of plant roots that spread out um, similar to the habit of their upper foliage. Um, whereas then the wildflower species very often have very deep tap roots that kind of uh, have a very different structure than the grasses. So together, the grasses and the wildflowers form this underground network of roots that is um, kind of works well with um, one another to make sure that the plant community stays vibrant with a diversity of species that not only um, provide structure to the shoreline or the wetland, but also food sources for wildlife. Uh, I thought this slide was kind of a nice handy slide. Um, just to kind of take a look at some of the different stem uh, shapes um, for ID. I, I particularly like um, the cross section of sedge and grass because sedges and grasses are, are very common um, and sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between them. But if you remember that sedges have edges and grasses are like straws, um, that can help you ID those plants growing in your wetland. Another important zone for restoring native plants uh, is the emergent zone. Um, we have a variety of emergent species in Minnesota. One of my favorites, pickerel, pickerel weed on the left, um, grows anywhere from you know three inches of water to about 18 inches of water, sometimes deeper. Um, uh, soft stem bulrush, another great example of a, almost a grass-like plant that has um, these beautiful uh, flower heads that get these droopy seeds on them. Um, again, a, a valuable uh, source of nectar and food for a variety of different insects and birds. And finally, aquatic plant zones. Um, many people think that duckweed is a, is a horrible uh, gross plant, but it's actually an indicator of a vibrant, uh, very healthy uh, wetland system, uh, as are uh, one of the many different species of water lilies we have in Minnesota, the white water lily. White water lily. Um, these, these plants can be purchased from nurseries if you're doing a restoration project. Um, don't transplant any of these plants from public waters. Um, and if you're going to do any transplanting in your own property, make sure that you have the required permit to do so, um, because these plants are a little trickier to deal with than just say going to your typical nursery. Um, but they are available and they are, are really fun to use in your design. Um, another important aspect to wetlands uh, we have a large number of native shrubs in Washington County. Here are a few of the better ones for establishing wetlands. We use uh, red osier dogwood quite frequently, as well as alder um, in designs. Um, I'm also very fond of elderberries, uh, particularly uh, red elderberry in areas where it's very, very shady and not a lot of other things grow. Um, vernal areas where you have those vernal pools where you've got um, you know wetland areas uh, in wooded shady areas elderberries can be a very valuable uh, shrub so if you're looking for uh, native plants we have a great resource um, available to you in this presentation with the many uh, native plant nurseries that we have in the area um, they're all uh, 
very knowledgeable about what's native in our specific region. So please, uh, if you're doing these projects, check them out. That's all I got. Thanks, Andy. Really appreciate it. Um, so the time is we are closing in fast on 730. I definitely want to spend a little bit of time uh, for folks to ask some questions of, of Jay and Andy. Um, I am going to very quickly uh, share my own screen um, just so we can uh, put this up there. Um, so again, if you live in Washington County, uh, aside from the Washington Conservation District, we have a wonderful network of um, uh, watershed districts um, that uh, do a lot of great work. And so in Washington County, you can see uh, several of these partners. Um, many of them have staff uh, that we work with quite regularly. Um, so just as a reference um, in terms of you, if you live in the area, um, knowing which watershed district you are part of. And then lastly, uh, Jay and Andrew have both indicated that they are um, happy to uh, uh, um, take emails um, and be contacted um, by folks who have questions. Um, we also have our uh, um, uh, conservation district website uh, listed there as well. Um, we're already starting to uh, um, kind of understand what the spring looks like in terms of being able to make site visits. And so there is a way that you're able to submit a site visit request uh, on the website. Um, if you are not in Washington County, um, so Jay has alluded several times to being able to reach out uh, to your local government um, uh, entity um, when you have questions uh, about your wetlands. And so with that, um, I do want to, I'll, I'll leave this up there, but I do want to uh, allow folks to uh, ask some questions uh, if you have them. So um, at this point, feel free to either just write that question in the chat, um, or uh, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself um, and uh, ask a question. Give everybody a second to type because I know all of you are bursting with questions, just burning with questions. <laughs> I always wonder what the uh, etiquette is around how much time you leave it quiet. Like how, how much silence is okay? I'm sure there is definitely been studies on such things. Isn't it seven seconds? I'm more of a three second fan. <laughs> I can see and that. Moving on. <laughs> and just as a reminder, um, we will be posting this video on YouTube and I intend to send a follow up email probably in the morning um, that has a lot of the resources that were referenced tonight. So talking about the protected waters DNR map, um, a lot of the, uh, the tools for being able to figure out um, whether or not you are in a wetlands, how do you get a wetland delineation, uh, maybe some of those nursery locations. Uh, Kathy has a question. Do you, design, question. do you design wetland plantings for the endangered rusty patch bumblebee? I see it in wetter areas here in St. Paul. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, we have a nice list of species that are known to be uh, rusty patch bumblebee food sources, and I incorporate those in a lot of designs. Um, and it's definitely a part of um, what I shoot for when I'm designing a plant community. And again, it's because the relationships between native bees and um, the ecological system as a whole is very complex and it's very important to kind of create that whole big picture plant community. So let's see, um, a couple more came in. How long has wetland been regulated? What triggered the start of those regulations? 
Uh, let's see, the Federal Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. Uh, the wetland, I think, components of that came in in the 80s. Uh, but the law was enacted because of, you know, severe water quality issues. And then wetlands are a piece of that because the, wet, the role of wetlands and water quality and groundwater protection and recharge. So we've had federal regulations for decades. Uh, the State Wetland Conservation Act was passed in 1991. Uh, that was passed because there was an, uh, a really a, um, a huge effort by a diverse number of groups uh, to get it passed in the legislature. And because in Minnesota, for example, in a lot of the state of Minnesota, we've lost over 80% of our wetlands. In the central part of Minnesota, we've lost you know, between 50 to 80% of our wetlands. So the law really was to uh, try to stop that loss. And so the goal of the Wetland Conservation Act is no net loss. Um, and, you know, and it all gets back to the, all those benefits that wetlands provide. And as, as we're going into this age with uh, uh, more frequent large storm events, the importance of wetlands is gonna, I think, be highlighted more and more because of their role in uh, flood, flood mitigation and water quality, in addition to kind of the refuge for wildlife and diversity. Another question, what spray do you recommend for invasive plants? Typically, uh, projects will have a mention of um, water safe glyphosate, which is uh, something like rodeo or Roundup. Um, I'm, you know, I, don't, I don't particularly like chemicals, but um, in this field of work, I've I've seen how many restoration projects just are not going to work without it, and that's just a, a sad fact of the matter. Um, when you're trying to battle canary regrass and buckthorn um, and invasive cattails, uh, it's unfortunately the best, most cost-effective way to deal with them is to use uh, chemicals in a safe and uh, very uh, kind of as little as possible way of doing so as you can. Um, it's good to have professional guidance when using them. So. Yeah, I think if you're looking at cattail removal, um, I've seen a lot more uh, success with mechanical removal because if you yeah. spray it, all that material dies and it oftentimes causes pretty significant nutrient issues within the wetland that you've just sprayed. And so... Yeah. Mechanical removal can, you know, remove the cattail, um, and depending on where you're at, if it's, you know, a Wetland Conservation Act regulated wetland, then you can excavate the cattail root up, you know, down to the cattail roots without triggering any permits. But you, it's better to double check on that and make sure that you coordinating that with the regulators. So when the neighbor calls, um, then you're covered because the neighbor will call. <laughs> the neighbor will call. We've had good luck with the. We've had good luck with the cut it below the water level. Yep. Mm -hmm. Late in the fall, and then it freezes out. And I'd, I've seen anywhere from like fifty to sixty five percent effectiveness with that at our own personal place. So that's pretty good. I'll take. Yeah, and there's some uh, you know tools that you can use to cut it below the water level too. There's like water yeah. and weed whacker sort of things. Any other questions for the good of the group? I'm waiting. Well, we still have 21 seconds. people, guys. We, we've only lost a couple. <laughs> good stuff. Good information. All right. Well, it is after 7.30. Um, Again, we really appreciate you uh, spending part of your evening with us and uh, we'll get this information uh, out to y'all um, in terms of the recording and some of the uh, additional resources that were talked about. So in the meantime, hope everybody has a great evening. Enjoy those, these last days before the snow comes and um, keep a watch on our website. We're gonna continue to bring you great educational content. All right, thank, thank you everybody. You, everybody. Have Thank you very evening. much. Good night.